partner and co-head at Generation Investment Management. Please welcome them to the stage. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Ah. Oh. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello. Thank you very much for flying in and coming to this event and speaking with Great me on stage. Yeah. Um, right, so let's just get right into it. Now, you guys are coming from two different places. You're an investor, you're a founder running a startup. You guys have a common, common ground, which is Africa, developing world, and doing things that are helping to build sustainable stuff in, in that region and on, in those economies. So why not, I, I want to kind of just start this off with you guys kind of giving me a little bit of a rundown on where, where you think the kind of the opportunity is in Africa. Sure, start that shall one. I start? Um, well, it's probably useful to give a little bit of, a little bit of context for Andela. So we're yeah. the top network of software engineers across Africa. We have around 1,300 engineers working across 200 companies primarily in the US, although increasingly now in Europe as well, as full-time dedicated team members. And mm -hmm. so one area that is pretty obvious is Africa is the youngest, fastest growing continent on the planet. It's the only continent that has an average age under 30. And our founding principle for Andela is that brilliance is evenly distributed. And so from a just human capital standpoint, brain power, it's an extraordinary opportunity for Africa and for the world because of the excitement happening right now across almost every major urban area on the continent around technology. Yeah. And from where gener Isla. Generation sits, we're a global investment management firm uh, based in, in the UK, also with offices in San Francisco. And we, for 15 years, have put sustainability research and analysis at the core of our investment processes. We manage around 23 billion across public and private, and I co-head with my partner, Lily, the growth equity strategy. And really, you know, when you put sustainability at the core of how you look at the sectors like agriculture, like energy, like enter enterprise and industrial, healthcare and financial services, you have to understand that there's disruptions. We think we're in the early stages of a tech-led sustainability revolution and that it incorporates environmental, social, and broader governance factors. Okay. And you guys are putting a lot of money into companies that are putting a lot into Africa and trying to tap into the growth that's going on there. Yeah, I just yeah. caveat, we do global and we yes. invest in US, Europe, but also yeah. emerging markets. We yeah. actually have both um, an investment in Andela. We also uh, have a company called Mcopa, uh, which is de delivering clean, en clean and distributed energy across Africa, but we do invest in Asia, we invest yeah. in Europe and, and abroad. Right. So it's, I wouldn't call us the specialist, no, yeah. but I, I think wanted, it's important yeah. that if yeah, you're yeah. taking a global view that you Absolutely. can follow your research and insights around sustainability trends into whichever geographies they have the most leverage. Yeah, I want to focus this conversation maybe a little bit more on Africa because of the Andela angle, um, if that's okay. Now, you guys are like, two of the many organizations and, and entities that are interested in, in developing markets, of course. Um, I would say that you know, one of the more interesting things for me in, 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 on the continent has been the role China's played there. They've, I, I was reading somewhere that it's been between 2005 and 2018, they, there were $299 billion invested from China into Africa, into various countries in Africa. And then they're committing, I think, another 60 billion in the next couple of years. Um, what do you think about that? It depends on the angle you look at it from. Yeah. I mean, I mean do I you think, think that's a healthy thing or a, I think it's know. really smart on China's, on China's part. I think yeah. the U.S. is pretty far behind China in terms of thinking about emerging markets and how they're going to like, invest and engage, uh, which is unfortunate for the U.S. Um, at the same time, the way that China has done it has certainly been controversial in a mm. number of situations. Yeah. Uh, and you know, when it comes to clauses that involve countries losing their ports uh, yeah. as a result of that investment, like that sounds more complicated. Yeah, I mean, do you think, do you think that it's, um, do you think it's ha been happening maybe too quickly and too, you know, too much is being given over to them? Or do you think that it's ha the way that it has to be in the initial stages to get the ball rolling on things? 
realistically, uh, no. I think across 54 countries, you yeah. could invest a lot more than that really right. effectively. I don't, I don't think it's a function of it being too quick. I think it's mostly a function of the rest of the world not realizing how much of an opportunity there is in that cross-pollination. Like, I actually yeah. think that what Lila was saying about how they don't necessarily like, look at just Africa, but rather take a more global approach. Yeah. A lot of the most interesting opportunities, I think, around Africa and emerging markets in general is yeah. not thinking of that market in isolation yeah. as only a function of that market, but rather how that market will engage with and work with the rest of the world. Yeah. And that's something I think is changing very rapidly as the rest of the world realizes they should engage and take Africa seriously, not just as, a, as part of an NGO strategy, but yeah. also as a business partner. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what I found really interesting about Andela is the way that you guys are tapping into, uh, into let's say, the African opportunity, it's, uh, for lack of a better way of, it uh, sounds a little cheesy saying it like that, but you know what I mean, don't you? Um, it's all good, yeah. But you know, like, on, on two levels, you're sort of, you're looking at it as a, um, potentially as a market to grow business, but it's also, you know, about tapping the talent. Um, how, are you guys, do you think that, that generation, but then also other VCs are seeing that double opportunity well enough right now? And let's say we don't just answer it just for Africa, but just say all emerging markets. I feel like so often it's about looking at it as a large population to sell to yeah. versus looking at the talent within it and, and trying to build something to build those economies up, if you see what I mean. Uh, absolutely. Which is, I think, what Andela really points to, which is so commendable. Yeah. But I mean, the way that yeah. we arrive at any investment idea is through very much kind of bottoms up research into how is how our sector shifting towards a more sustainable future. Yeah. So we look at planetary health, people health, and financial inclusion. Part of financial inclusion for us is an understanding of the future of work. And we think through our probably now three or four years of laying down a remote collaboration roadmap and then a jobs marketplace roadmap and really led by colleagues of mine, Shalini, Lily, and Anthony, that they have determined that the future of work is one that is resilient, distributed, and global. Okay, yeah. so that's kind of leads you to say, well, it could be that you find interesting business models in North America or Europe, but let's actually take that thesis and then go look at where our untapped supply source, yeah. very high quality, and where you can merge education and upskilling yeah. into you know, kind of market opportunity, that this yeah. is really um, not a, uh, a kind of a low cost strategy. This is very much kind of value optimization for those countries and then those companies that can tap into that. Yeah, but I mean, do you think that generally, I, when I think of sometimes, when I think of foreign investment into Africa, um, into like um, startups or into, into the like African economies, um, it's mostly to develop them as markets, so as endpoints for products, rather than for, you know, working on their educational systems to improve uh, the founding of startups out of, you know, homegrown startups and so on. Do you think that we're seeing enough or do you think that we're just at that point where that hasn't been able to happen yet because the infrastructure isn't quite there yet? I mean, wh what do you guys think? Jeremy, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, it's, the challenge is, like, you could look at Lagos and it's, uh, Lagos, Nigeria is a city of 20 million people. Yeah. Like, it is a metropolis by any reasonable standards. The sort of, think of it as the like high-end consumer class is really affluent, yeah. but it's still relatively small. Yeah. And so consumer-driven startups are still challenging. There are yeah. more and more of them, yeah. and there's some pretty exciting examples, but B2B and FinTech have made more progress yeah. thus far, because there's a lot of business activity that takes place right. across, across these ecosystems. What's been interesting over the past five years as we've grown is there's been a dramatic shift in interest in being a technologist. So it's not just yeah. in using WhatsApp or Twitter, but yeah. it's actually building the next WhatsApp or Twitter. Yeah. Thinking about that in an African context. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because you've got a generation of young people thinking of technology as part of how they're going to show the world that they're as talented mm -hmm. as anyone else and that people from their country are as talented as anyone else. Yeah. And part of what Andela does is enable software developers across you know, the six countries we operate yeah. in to compete on a global level because they're working with startups in San Francisco, New York, yeah, exactly. you know, London, and you know, increasingly other parts of Europe. Yeah, um, I mean, it's quite interesting because I remember once um, uh, vetting a startup for the battlefield, you know, this big competition that we have, um, and I, I was asked to take a look at it and tell, you know, give my opinion on should we put them on the short list or not. And they were introduced to me by one of my colleagues 
um, as this guy is the next Jack Dorsey. He is the Jack Dorsey of Africa. <laughs> Wait, Jack Dorsey came to our campus like two weeks ago. Yeah. We just came to Africa. In fact, <laughs> that's what I'm and that's what I'm getting to. <laughs> Perfect. So he's now said he's gonna he's gonna go and live there for like six months yeah. or something like that. Now, uh, what is your what? What do you guys think about that? So, like, on the one hand, are you do you think that's inspiring, or does it seem like a kind of pithy sort of like PR stunt? You know, just a jolly, as they say in England. I I want to hear both of your opinions on this. You I, can speak amongst yeah. friends. We're amongst friends here, Yeah, this right? is all confidential, right? Everybody, everybody, everybody trusts not no, to take this out no of the tweeting. room, right? Okay. What do you think about Jack Dorsey going and moving to Africa? So I think it's actually funny that the world doesn't see how obviously good this is as an idea. If you look at the yeah. population graph between now and 2100, every continent looks relatively consistent. Right. Except for Africa. Yeah. In 2100, half of the world's population, roughly, is going to live in Africa. Right. By 2040, half of everyone graduating from high school will live in Africa. Right. So if you were a consumer-driven like, you know, social media platform, say, and you cared a lot about total population size, right. understanding Africa, especially because you can't really engage effectively in China, understanding Africa is obvious over the yeah. next 20 years. And if you're even looking over the next 10, it's pretty close to obvious. And yeah. so, yeah, I think it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. What do you think? I concur. I mean, I think that to, to in, the, in the broader you know, view, can, can people learn, you know, get new perspectives by putting themselves in different circumstances and uh, observing how cultures are different and what market opportunities might come from that? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I mean, do you think, do you think that he's... If, if, is it, do you think it's a sort of a work trip? Or do you think it's more that he's, because he does love to go on like kind of <laughs> meditative kind of journeys of self-discovery. I mean, do you think, it's a, I think it's really interesting because I think a lot of people see it as like, oh, this is about, you know, like he's going to finally do something with Bitcoin and it's going to be there, you know, a, or, you know, is this about Twitter or is it just, you know, like, can you see uh, like realistically something coming out of it that might be a business yeah. opportunity? I mean, I, I think of it through the lens of like, and I don't want to psychoanalyze the guy, Yeah. but I, uh, I would do that. But yeah, yeah. You're, okay. you're totally, it's, you're totally <laughs> welcome to. Um, but I, I think of it through the lens of, yeah, it's, yeah. it's clearly a thing that is relevant for Twitter. Yeah. Probably for Square as well, but definitely yeah. for Twitter. But also, he's someone who's just kind of innately curious. And if you yeah. want to understand where the world is going, yeah. whether that's the world of technology or just yeah. the world more broadly, it's a useful thing to understand yeah. what's happening in Africa now and how those trends are going to play out. And so yeah. I would say for the curious folks in the audience, if you haven't spent time in the major, major cities around the continent of Africa, it's not that far away. Check it out. Yeah. It's totally worthwhile. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's really interesting. We've, we've had a few events there. And so I've, yeah. I've, had, I've been really fortunate to go and like, spend time in, 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 in Kenya and so on. Oh, cool. and, yeah, oh God, I loved it. Um, I, was, I was there yesterday. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if it's Wednesday, this must be Kenya. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, so I, um, I, like, um, I, I, I thought it was a fascinating place. And you do get this, like, when you start to meet founders there, you start to really, I mean, A, it's, you can see just how much work there is. It's pretty, it's pretty rudimentary in many ways, very un, unconstructed, which is in, in its own way is wonderful because you can kind of, they have their own way of inventing how they're going to do these things. They don't need to follow a rule book from the valley. You know, they can, yeah. they can just go and, and kind of find their own way of figuring out what their market is and how to target that market. They also have a lot of problems. They have like a, a missing, crucial missing bits of infrastructure for enabling that to happen. One of them is capital. You know, I, I usually, I, after I got back from there, I made this crazy point of, I would meet with, you know, a VC from Index or wherever and be like, why are you doing more in Africa? Just why are you? I don't understand. You guys have, you're swimming in money. There's I, too much money out there. I've had there. those conversations. Yeah. I mean, they're swimming in money. As my, one, of my, one of my banker friends says, it's just too much damn money right now. And that's why you get other problems, you know, but mm -hmm. I, it's still a surprise to me. I mean, do you have conversations with other VCs where, where you guys talk about, do they look to you guys for more guidance on how to target these slightly darker, darker boxes, black boxes, or you know, whatever you want to call it? If I keep going back to where we, 
where we spend our time is thinking about how these dis technology disruptions touch big sustainability challenges, and in particular, you know, the bending the curve and likelihood we think we can meet the sustainable development goals by 2050. Yeah. You know, you have to look broadly. So we, yeah. you know, we have an example where we've done a lot of work on mobility, in particular electrification and kind of um, autonomy, and that led us actually to inv invest in a company that was in Taiwan. So there was a lot. Of, there's a lot going on in mobility. It just like was that was the place where there was an entrepreneur who was addressing air pollution in Southeast Asia through a you know a, a non non toxic, um, yeah. efficient, uh, scalable mobility platform with battery swap. How are you able to source these companies? So that just led, they, led us they there, and we felt like those yeah. were like the, the the frontiers where you just should take your research and explore yeah. the way best way to play it. But do you guys approach them or do they come to you? Do you think that there's a good enough avenue between VCs in the West mm. and companies in non-Western countries who need this funding? So I don't think there is robust avenues. Yeah. It isn't, you don't know exactly who to call on. And if you're raising money from those regions, you know, which are the entrepreneurs, which are the um, either venture, in our case, we're growth capital, so a little bit later stage, mm. which ones to go tap? I mean, we met both that company and I think um, identified and Andela through some of our um, convenings, like a summit. We do these events yeah. with um, with Vice President Gore to convene uh, groups on a topic of the future of food, the future of consumer, the future of uh, healthcare, and we did one on the future of mobility. And we actually had heard of and um, wanted to meet this entrepreneur. Uh, he joined us for that summit. Okay. We tracked that company. In that in that same summit, we had I think the mayor from one of the major cities in Brazil. We had some some um, of the policy leaders globally. So we try to take that global perspective yeah. into everything. But, so you know, you have yeah. to look for it. You, it's not just going to come walk into your door in New York City or San Francisco or you know yeah. or Berlin. Actually, okay. more likely probably Berlin. Yeah, it's Berlin, Berlin international. actually, I think yeah. you get a lot of people walking yeah. into a room, yeah. Um, <laughs> so now I have uh, another thing. I'm glad you, you referred to Al Gore a second ago because I did want to mention the G word. Um, so I, he's like a kind of, you know, large part of, you know, forming generation. He was one of the founding partners and yep. so on. Um, obviously, having been a former vice president for eight years and a politician for many more than that, um, and a really high-ranking one, uh, he's you know has a really interesting thing to bring to the table, which is a lot of knowledge and information about uh, how the world works. Um, how how has his kind of geopolitical knowledge? impacted your own decision making? Have, have you guys been able to identify things you think faster than others? Do you think that you are able to avoid certain things? Like, has he given you guys steers at any point of like, that looks good, but I wouldn't touch it? Or, you know, does, I, does how, how involved does he get in that stuff? And, and I don't just mean as a regular guy, but I mean as the former vice yeah. president of the United States who yeah. is very nearly also the president. Yeah. So we're incredibly blessed, and I think actually the perspective that someone like um, Gore brings to the table is an indication of how we value diversity in decision making. I actually think this is something that's really critical to how Indela drives not only its employee um, retention and then ultimately engagement with its customers, but that um, we have a team that represents on our growth growth fund, you know, 11 different nationalities. It's almost 60% female. You know, we do have. Um, um, Vice President Gore on our investment committee. Again, the perspectives that other people on our investment committee brings are, are, are I immense because these are global um, investors or people who have run businesses. I mean, we really do harness diversity. It's not just Al Gore is what you're saying. Well, I, I yeah. love working with him and it's an extraordinary asset and we, you know, we tap that insight all the time. Does he, but does he get that? I mean, there are different ways he can be involved. One is being a pretty much a very, you know, visible LP. Yeah. He's the kind of guy who will probably open doors, you know, um, just, just by yeah. being there. But is he actually actively, like, proactively involved? In incredibly. I mentioned these summits because we just had one two weeks ago in San Francisco on the future of healthcare. You know, two days where we're sitting around a single table and he is our, um, our convener with a group of 40 experts across, in, you know, big companies, small companies, Policymakers, academics, like the yeah. whole gamut. We are, it's just such an incredible asset to be able to leverage. And we brought him to a town hall with Andela post investment 
to help you know, engage employees on the connection between the future of work yeah. that is more distributed, resilient, and global, right. and then the climate crisis, in particular in the con continent of Africa. So yeah. maybe you could talk about the, yeah. the visit I mean, he had. He also convened a summit on the future of work, yeah. and in particular, distributed engineering teams, about a month ago in San Francisco, with us and a number of other companies. He's yeah. been actually impressively active as, a, as an investee. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't exactly sure what to expect before. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. the thing is, I don't know if you remember, but when he was running for president, um, the, the, one of the, it's kind of crazy to think of it as a criticism, but people used to say, he's kind of too smart. You know, like he was almost like kind of full of so much knowledge and so kind of in some ways actually almost a little too cerebral that he wasn't able to really have that kind of common touch that really spoke to the wider, uh, you know, the wider world of, uh, of, of you know people who are you know uh, getting uh, the voters you know the, the uh, you know, like average American constituent because he was just like actually too too smart you know in some ways I can sort of see that being more of an asset in the slightly smaller and uh, in a way more rarefied like world of investing in startups than in like you know like doors you know <laughs> knocking on people's doors and town halls and that kind of thing but I, I laugh because it feels almost prophetic given where we've come to in terms of US leadership so I know you're well, right. yeah he I know the irony too smart yeah. I know yeah I know <laughs> I mean if we even knew what was around the yeah. corner we used to like joke about how George W was so common and blah, 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 <laughs> you know I mean you know we misunderestimated it <laughs> deeply <laughs> just deeply. kidding yeah um, okay now I just want to move the conversation on a little now Andela you guys are I'm looking at the time. Now you guys have, um, it's been all Africa for you guys. Do you have any plans on going to any other markets? I mean, eventually, Andela will be a global story because when yeah. you think about what our customers care about, yeah. like there was a, uh, a tweet that Jack, or not Jack Dorsey, that um, Bill Gurley put out a couple months ago where he said every single portfolio company of mine in San Francisco is either like actively thinking about building a team outside of San Francisco or the US yeah. or has already done it. Yeah. Like this is, it's not a new phenomenon, but it's accelerating dramatically yeah. because finding engineering talent, especially high quality engineering talent that's going to work in real time yeah. with you and your team is really tough. The fact that the world hasn't thought of Africa historically as a like hub of talent is crazy. The lack I of agree. like business integration, yeah. but it's not like brilliant seemingly distributed. It's not just a function of Africa. You've got yeah. incredible engineers, like there are far more incredible engineers outside of the Bay and outside of New York than there are inside of those areas. Of and so smart companies are now thinking about that like on a regular basis, even at very early stages. Okay. So I think that eventually, yes, that Andela will where be a global would you go? story. Like where would you go beyond Africa? It's too early to say at this point. We're okay. very much Africa focused here. So, but yeah, yeah, so you're not, you're not like doing exploratory, you know, looking in, into different countries in Latin America or anything like that? No, but we have, yeah. we have uh, customers, partner companies yeah. across a wide variety of geographies already. And yeah. I actually think Europe is growing, you know, amongst the fastest of them. Uh, and I think are you saying that in terms of, of your zone. end customers or the, where you're sourcing the end developers? Customers. Yeah, the developers yeah. are all based in six African countries. Yeah, right I now. know. Yeah. Uh, but the end customers that are working with our yeah. developers, like yeah. you've got a number of folks like in Europe, in part because of the time zone yeah. overlap. And that's a big part of why companies also in the US appreciate it. You can shift a few hours and overlap with, you know, even the West Coast for at least half a day. Mm -hmm. You're just not that far away. Yeah. Um, can I just ask you, I think you guys had some layoffs recently. We did. Um, I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, can you speak to me a little bit about, can we just use that for a moment to just, uh, we're running out of time, to talk about the challenges <laughs> of what it takes to source people in these developing economies? And you might have something to say on that too, Lila. I mean, I, I think when we think, when we go to, what does a sustainable business look like? It is yeah. not only what they do, and how, but how they operate. Yeah. And so the what they do is like, what are the products and services that they sell? So Indela matches, you know, um, full stack software engineers with, you know, yeah. with companies that need to scale that do not have access to that talent. What they are best at is a certain part of the market that they've got amazing product market fit. And so, yeah. you know, you want those companies to do that better than anyone else. 
On the how they operate, this is something that we're incredibly proud of, of, of our portfolio companies, and in Dell in particular. How do you treat human capital in tough you know, transition times? How do you um, engage and grow a culture? How do you um, manage governance structures? You know, what are the alignment? What's the diversity profile? Like All of those assets are the how a business operates. And sort of, if you could touch on maybe yeah, the, the what, what are the really, really seriously. What, what is the challenge? Like, so why, the challenge, why did you guys lay those The challenge off? there was that it was actually much more a function of what is the market asking from a seniority level? Okay. And so if you go back to the very beginning of the company, it was primarily junior engineers. Right. Extremely talented. Like we accepted 0.7% of applicants right. program. But over time, we had to diversify that from primarily, you know, it was probably 70 to 80% junior to more like 30 to 40%. Got it. So it was really a shift in the overall like yeah. makeup based uh -huh. on what companies as you move into okay. larger companies we're looking for. Okay, are you finding that you're able to source those types of developers and engineers from that market or are you trying to work on trying to train people to be able to fit that more like it, it has position? to be a little bit of both okay. it has to be a little bit of both and yeah so yeah. far we continue to grow you know right compound annual growth over the past three years is well over 100 percent are you guys raising more money at the moment no 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 okay how much have you raised so far 180 million okay pittance yeah, just kidding. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you, Ingrid. Time to go. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having Thanks, us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, back. everyone. Thanks, everybody.